So I think we can start. Thank you everybody for being here. Today we're going to talk about uh, recognition of pattern over the surface of the 3D object. Uh, the speaker is uh, Elia Muscolo Thompson, which is a third uh, year PhD student, as well as a research fellow at the CNR in Malta. So please. Thank you for the presentation. Hi everyone, and um, again, thank you for coming. My, um, as uh, Claudia said, I'm a PhD student in my third year, and my research belongs in the computer vision, uh, in the computer vision research field, in collaboration with the uh, cultural heritage uh, research field. In particular, the, the interest in what uh, became the, the main goal of my PhD thesis is, uh, revolves around uh, a particular problem that may help uh, archaeologists in, the, in doing their work. So, in particular, what um, a collaboration between these two research fields uh, is done by um, proposing and create, creating and proposing tools to archaeologists so they are able to, do, uh, to better do their, their job. In, um, in particular, uh, this interest part from a project uh, that is under right now that is called the Gravity Project, in which uh, um, which uh, focused on uh, on uh, a number of problems, and one of these problems, which is the pattern recognition problem, became one uh, uh, became the one uh, I'm interested in. So, um, right now uh, in this uh, in this presentation, I will uh, describe you what I'm doing to what what I'm currently doing to solve this problem, and uh, finally. I will uh, talk about some of the problems that I still have to solve and eventually how I plan to uh, conclude this, uh, this PhD. So, the, um, all the requests that the archaeologists gave to, to us in computer vision uh, um, when asked which problem they would like to, to be solved automatically or partially automatic, all revolves around the similarity, which is a concept that by itself in uh, cultural heritage environment doesn't mean much. For example, here we have a set of models we have, uh, the, that are derived from the same data set, arguably decent. And uh, the, main, the question here which are the mod, uh, is which of, the, of these models are similar. And again, by itself, it doesn't mean that much because you can see, for example, this model similar to this model because they are covered by the same scale pattern. But of course, they, there are other things for which they are dissimilar. For example, the, the overall shape, or uh, rather the fact that this uh, uh, model here has also something here that is not uh, a scale pattern. These two models, for example, may be considered similar because they share a similar expression and face. But they, for example, their hair is not represented in a similar way. So are they similar or dissimilar? When this, the, we have a data set of artifacts, the, the way we assess similarity must be uh, based on what are we uh, considering of the object. Among all the possible object, the, all, all the possible features that, that we may consider on, on a model, the, the particular feature that, that I'm interested in is the pattern, as you can imagine. In particular, I, I look for a way to, to localize, characterize, and analyze the patterns that lies on, on a surface. By pattern, in this context, I mean, uh, for example, uh, pattern given by the color. So here we have some flower repeated over these models. Or by the bending of the surface. For example, this one here, we have the stripes that are chiseled on the surface. It's not really visible in this slide, but here, for example, the head of this statue has a small circlet that are chiseled on, uh, on the top of the surface. So, the... Um, the main, problem, uh, the main problem here is, uh, is called uh, pattern recognition and uh, is defined more or less as follows. We have a set of patterns that are give, uh, given by us as query pattern, which are this one, and a set of models on which uh, the, this pattern may or may not be uh, represented. The, the point here is, uh, is to, for each of the query pattern, uh, local, uh, understand if uh, it's, it's present on the, on the models, so, for example, the green one is present here, here, but not here. And also, uh, to um, find a way to understand where this, um, aside from where it is, to distinguish the two patterns. So, I don't want just a method that is able to say, okay, in this area there is no pattern here and here and here there is a pattern, but I also want a way to uh, characterize them and uh, understand that they are different. 
Of course, uh, the, um, this problem can be seen in two ways. As I said, the characterization part and the localization part. But then uh, in the first two years of my PhD, I focused more on the first part. And uh, in particular, there is a, sm a slightly simpler problem, which is the pattern retrieval uh, problem, which basically is the same as the pattern recognition one, but the surface that I'm considering are uh, completely covered by a pattern. So I don't have the problem of localizing it. This uh, uh, allowed me to concentrate more on the characterization aspect of the problem. And uh, once this, uh, the, the characterization part was, uh, was uh, suffi sufficiently um, explored, uh, uh, I propose to, uh, I was making to extend this, uh, the, the results obtained in the pattern retrieval problem to the pattern recognition. This uh, uh, more or less worked, and we will see how in, in a minute. The um, one thing to keep in consideration here is that of, uh, all these patterns are given, as you can see, for example, in this slide, by a property of the surface. So, for example, the, the colorimetric one are given by the, um, the color that are represented on the surface, while the, the geometric one, there is no directly, um, there is no uh, simple property that defines them just by uh, considering the, the data that are in the scanned object, which may be translation or cloud points. And this information is not uh, uh, trivially contained there. And the, the, the property that we use to compute this, uh, the, that we use to characterize this pattern is the, the curvature. Of course, the, uh, the curvature is a property that is well defined on, um, on, um, on con continuous surfaces. And is something that uh, cannot be trivially extended to triangulation and cloud points because of course, the cloud points are just points and there are no surfaces, so the definition doesn't make sense. While on, sorry, so on triangulation, the, while on triangulation, the, the, it's basically the surface is made by faces, so it, it doesn't make sense to compute the curvature because it is zero or, or over all the surface. What uh, uh, was done then uh, when I started studying the pattern retrieval problem was trying to uh, look for uh, um, uh, approximation of the curvature on those surfaces, um, which exist, of course, exist, uh, uh, and they based on uh, different uh, criteria. Some of them, for example, try to fit, uh, um, try to approximate the surfaces, the surfaces with quadric, and then try to compute the, the curvature on those quadric. And uh, most of these methods are um, most of the methods are um, tested on surfaces surfaces. In which, uh, I, in which the, there is a ground truth, so the, the, the actual value of the curvature is known. Uh, the point here is, is that the, this approximation were not really great for my purpose because they, also, they, they are always tested on uh, models with, uh, um, how can I say, large bending, like, uh, for example, other, other surfaces and so on. But since uh, the pattern are usually small and repeated feature over the surface, I was more interested in uh, incubator that were able to uh, more widely um, differentiate some uh, the, the small bending of the surface. So uh, I did a comparison between these two, these uh, uh, eight methods that are freely available on uh, on the internet, and uh, I came up with a method that was able to. Uh, approximated this. Uh, I mean, I didn't came up. I found the, the method that best approximated the curvature in the way uh, we were interested in. The, um, this uh, helped me uh, so, uh, characterize the, the pattern on um, on the surface. But by itself, the curvature is not able. To, is not discrimi discriminative enough to solve the problem of pattern retrieval. So, in other way, the, the, the value of the curvature alone is not enough to uh, to, discri to discretize the, the the various pattern that may be embedded on a surface. The method that I came up in this uh, in the in the previous two years uh, to solve the pattern recognition problem is actually split in two. The the first uh, version of this method is called the HLPP, which is a method that extends a well-known uh, uh, operator that uh, solves the problem of pattern recognition on images, which is the local binary pattern. I will try to be quick on uh, on this because um, explaining both the local binary pattern and uh, the HLPP would take much more time than we have uh, today. 
but basically the local binary pattern is uh, studies the variation of the, the of the radius of the of the grayscale value of the pixel of an image around each pixel. The, the, the this comparison results in a linear an array and a, a pattern then is characterized by each and every one of these array based on the pattern that we are characterizing. The extending this uh, to surface was not trivial because while on pixel we have a very rigid structure of pixel, um, which are always located more or less in the same position. The, um, in uh, triangulation, which was the initial test, uh, use case of this uh, of my of my research, we have no fixed position and we are not, we don't have the luxury of uh, always having having a an even uh, an even sampling, uh, an even distribution of vertex uh, on the surface because uh, the, 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 these uh, variations are very, very small and we also need to work not to be the one million vertex, but we still need to keep uh, the number of vertex very low in order to work with this in a reasonable amount of time. The way I created the, the sample, uh, the, the, the equivalent of the pixel in the on the surface is by, uh, by intersection of spheres uh, centered in each vertex on the edges of a triangulation. So for example, here we could, can consider a vertex, we can consider uh, the, the sphere that is centered in this vertex here, and all the intersection with the edges, which are these black dots, form the, 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 the equivalent of the ring of pixel that there was in the image, and uh, the characterization then is done in a similar way, so the, all uh, for each one of these rings, the, uh, a scalar pops depending based on how the curvature value is sampled on this circle, and a, an histogram of this value is then uh, performed, and the histogram became the uh, pattern, the, the descriptor of the pattern that is impressed on this surface. The, um, the, this method that outperform uh, basically all the, the, the other technique that performed a similar job in the, in the literature at the time, which was like one and a half year ago, um, had a problem because uh, um, it's, uh, uh, it has a high computational cost, and, we, and all the cost raise up in the way I check for this intersection. So why this, the, the approach overall works and the method was uh, very, uh, the performance of the method were very high. The, I still had a problem in, um, in using, in uh, computing the descriptor of um, pattern that has uh, a high number of vertex. And uh, uh, this may not look like uh, much of a problem, but uh, you have to remember that uh, Pattern are uh, again small uh, um, variation of the surface, so it requires a level of detail that uh, must be very very high. So we need a high number of vertex, and so the luxury of having uh, uh, of working with uh, meshes that uh, have a low number of vertex is not always something that we can do. So um, in the second year, I came up in collaboration with the uh, Institute of Research uh, CNR, CNRS uh, at Lyon in France. I created a similar method which, uh, again, extended the local binary pattern on surface, but this time the navigation of the mesh is done not by the intersection of spheres and the edges, but using the uh, KD3 structure in order to divide a neighborhood, the neighborhood of each of the points of the of the mesh we are considering in two sectors. So imagine to having this grid placed here, and um, each sector assume a value, which is the mean of the curvature values uh, of, this, of the points that fell in each sector, and then uh, the local binary pattern is computed on uh, this uh, on this structure, as it was uh, computed in the, in the case of the image. And, the, and while the performance stays more or less the same, in this case the MPVP, uh, of course, working with the KD3 has a much lower computational cost, and uh, this allows us to obtain uh, a satisfying solution for the for the particular problem, which was uh, a bit uh, which um, which has a much lower uh, computational cost than uh, the previous method called the uh, The um, so, based on this characterization, we were sufficient, sufficiently satisfied with the, 
with the method we came up for taking the pattern of the trigger problem. And uh, the, so we try to extend directly this approach to the uh, to the pattern retrieval, to the pattern recognition problem. Main point here is that uh, this, uh, uh, of course, work on meshes that are uh, uh, fully covered by a single pattern. So in order to triply extend this method to, to the service, I need a uh, um, segmentation method for the meshes that uh, is able to discretize between uh, meshes that are fully covered by uh, pattern or meshes that do doesn't contain pattern. And uh, while usual, uh, usually the um, Usually, the, the, the different patterns on a cultural heritage object are separated by something. So, for example, here there is like a step. That's, that is not always the case. And uh, uh, to, my, to my knowledge, the, um, the current state of the art for the segmentation is not, uh, is not able to perform this, uh, uh, the segmentation that I'm interested in. So, uh, I, I needed to look for uh, another method to uh, try to. Uh, this, uh, understand where a pattern uh, is impressed on the surface and where it's not. The, while again working with this uh, other uh, research institute, institute in Lyon, we uh, try to tackle this problem using uh, uh, what is called the dictionary learning. The dictionary learning is a method to perform a sparse decomposition, and uh, I will try to briefly describe it now. So, uh, by taking a number of signals, a uh, number n of a signal, x i, uh, that belongs to R d. We uh, fix a number m, which is this, uh, we, which we call the, the size of the dictionary, a uh, fixed value k, which is called sparsity. And the goal, by uh, stacking uh, all these uh, signals in a matrix, x i, is to find uh, uh, a matrix D and a matrix A so that this relation is uh, satisfied, which in other words means that I would like to, for each signal, find a, uh, a set of, uh, we, can call, we can call them a set of generators, which uh, uh, just by taking K of them, I'm able to describe all the signal at best, all this K, uh, the, the, um, this val this, uh, value, sorry, this array that are uh, called atoms uh, does not need, uh, don't need to be different for each signal. Uh, the only constraint I, that I have is that I need the M of these atoms and I, I need uh, to be able to reconstruct all the signal just by using K, uh, a number K of them. So, um, this is a method that is already used in images for uh, plenty of applications like image denoising, painting, but also facial recognition. And uh, while I'm computing these metrics in a phase called uh, of course, training, the, the main aspect of this, um, uh, of this, uh, of this process that uh, shape the, the atoms uh, that are in, uh, in, the, in the coefficient is uh, uh, the, the repetition of the signal. So if there is a signal that repeats over and over and over and over, uh, it's um, likely that one of the atoms will assume the, the shape of the signal that uh, repeats uh, more frequently. So um, since the pattern, uh, since this is similar in a way to how the feature that represents the patterns uh, appears on the surface, it's a problem that is possible to relate uh, simply with uh, uh, the problem of pattern recognition. Uh, sorry, the, it's possible to relate the problem of, the, of training a dictionary on the signal representing the pattern to the pattern recognition problem itself. Uh, by um, using a signal, the, the punto descriptor of the pattern uh, of the MPLBP, which was the one presented before, I was able to um, see that uh, when I train a dictionary on a specific point repeated uh, in, on a surface, so for example, training the points in the center of this, the, 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 I'm sorry, training the, the, a dictionary on all this surface, the, there are atoms that uh, are shaped as uh, the feature that are interested in. This is uh, uh, important because the, um, I, if uh, there, is, uh, there are atoms that uh, 
um, represents part of the surface, I am able to study the presence or the absence of pattern on a surface just based on the atoms, which usually are in a much, much lower number than the, all the points uh, on the surface. So I am able to uh, have an overall look on the surface much more quickly. The other things to notice is that uh, um, well, while I was uh, training this dictionary, I observed that some, uh, if I have a pattern embedded in a, in a surface that is bended, this is, is not visible here, but it's bended like a, a, a cup, the, there are atoms that, that uh, focus, focuses on, on the pattern, and there are atoms that focuses on, uh, on how the underlying surface is bended. This means that in a way that we may consider this problem uh, uh, as, uh, as an additive one, in which we can, uh, we can sample a signal on a surface and we may check uh, if uh, the, the signal is part of a pattern, if we are able to remove the, the bending atom uh, from uh, the, the decomposition that is given by the, by the dictionary. This allows us basically to divide the problem into, into parts. And, uh, Right now, what I'm doing is trying to understand if uh, this uh, is enough to um, characterize, uh, if not directly, the pa a pattern on a surface to characterize if, it's, if uh, uh, an area of a surface has a pattern or not. Of course, uh, um, there are uh, some um, there are some problems because. The, the dictionary, of course, uh, highly, the, the training of the dictionary, of course, highly depend on the way we train the uh, on the on how much uh, signal repeats. So, if there there are uh, there is a large number number of variety in the, in the signal that I feed into the dictionary, the the atoms will probably not represent something uh, that is uh, useful for uh, for our research. So, what I'm trying to do here right now is to try to find a way if I can uh, remove some signal uh, before training a dictionary. So if, for example, uh, a surface has a flat area, like here, I would like not to add this uh, flat area uh, to the signal that will eventually train the dictionary. That's because, uh, of course, for an um, in situ surface, that's, that's a perfectly flat, but in case of cultural heritage object, I have something that uh, may be slightly corrupted by noise, slightly corrupted by the aging of the model, which is basically something that I don't want to add in my, in my study. And also, uh, the pro one problem with addiction is that uh, it's highly rotational dependent, so it depends on uh, how I sample my, my signal. So what I'm uh, trying to fix right now is trying to give uh, uh, the same orientation to this uh, um, this kind of signal to the to the sampling to the feature that I'm sampling with the punto descriptor, and right now we have uh, I implement some crafty solution that are not that are still working for us, so I prefer not to talk about it right now. But uh, um, I'm still looking for a way to simply orient the signal. Uh, so, for example, passing from this configuration to this configuration here. And another problem, which is something that I'm still uh, dealing with, is uh, the parameter of the, of the dictionary that I should use in this case. Because, of course, all the parameters that I said before, the sparsity, the size of the dictionary, etc., are all parameters that uh, should be fixed before training the dictionary, or should be fixed after the, the dictionary is computed. And these are things that I'm currently working on, and uh, uh, I hope they will give uh, satisfying results. In, um, in conclusion, I, pr I think to, that I plan to use the, the results uh, what are they are, of, the, of the dictionary learning uh, in, uh, in two ways. Uh, hopefully, the, the results will tell based on the atoms if uh, there, is a, there is not a pattern on the surface and uh, uh, also based on the atoms give me a way to characterize them. So uh, while the work on the PLBP and the SBP on the pattern retrieval were useful, it is not necessary, or actually not necessary to solve the pattern recognition problem. On the other hand, if uh, the characterization of the atom is sufficient to give me uh, if the presence or the absence of an atom, but not a, a, a good characterization of them, I can basically use the, the, this uh, more, um, this less uh, discriminative, uh, discriminative uh, classification of, the, of a patch of the model. Uh, 
to create a uh, segmentation on which I can compute the MPVP and the MZP. Of course, uh, this is not the only way that I, that, uh, or to solve the problem that I'm currently working right now. I also have something uh, related to the uh, combinational neural network, but uh, I, 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 it's not something that I want to take here because we take too much time. And also, it's very, very. I, I have some just uh, very preliminary results. So uh, that's it for now today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Or you have a bunch of uh, of atoms already predefined, then you use them as an approximation of your signal. So um, is a uh, uh, this uh, um, actually the experiment uh, in, in this direction were done in two ways. The first one was uh, um, based on the, the observation here, in which I have uh, uh, basically the subdivision of the problem in uh, the the bending atom and the pattern relative to the pattern. Once I observed that this sometimes happened if I train the dictionary with particular parameters, I thought that maybe I could give uh, to the dictionary uh, I can pre uh, initialize the atoms of a dictionary based on uh, the bending that uh, I, the, the, the bending given by the quantic approximation of the surface. Because uh, if I center properly the, the surface uh, in, a, in a given point, I can approximate it more or less well with a quadric, which is uh, given by x square um, coefficient x square plus coefficient epsilon square. So I can just sample the signal on x square, a signal on x square, a signal on epsilon square, and then if the the dictionary works correctly, the, the coefficient given by that atom is the coefficient that I needed to approximate the surface. So a way to face this problem would be to initialize the atom that I'm interested in, both in terms of the bending and in terms of the atom of the pattern that I'm interested in describing. And the other instead is let, just let the dictionary do it all by itself. So each dictionary is specific for each problem, only one mesh? Uh, there is a dictionary specific for only one mesh, but the, the, the results obtained by the the, the atom that came up from the from the dictionary should be universal in a way. That was my basic question. Is let's assume you have I don't know uh, k signals that mm -hmm. you can use to uh, replicate a mesh. So uh, how, how big k should be? Because if you have the, the, I mean like, the the, spot, the, 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 the the number I mean the, the number of signal you you have to use. Mm -hmm. Or, um, so, sorry, so how, how the result changes depending. Sorry, let me read. How the result will change with respect to the size of the dictionary? Expect different result. Uh, yeah. So, Humans, by uh, given a set of signal, just by changing the size of the dictionary, will change. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is the answer is it depends, of course. The, um, the thing is that if uh, I'm training uh, the, the, um, the dictionary on a model, which is maybe this one, which you can see this for with the three patterns, the um, if the number is compared, the number of atoms is comparable to the number of patterns. Usually, the atoms uh, uh, focuses on um, on one of the patterns. That's not always, of course, the case. Uh, and if I increase the number of, of atoms, the, if I still if I still stay pretty low, so from like 10, I, I jump to, to 20. Uh, there are some atoms that can be basically noisy, but they are usually uh, characterized by having a norm that is severely low because because they try to mediate the many many okay. signals. But uh, there are maybe replica of the same atoms, which is something that is still allowed here. And uh, what I was saying before, by we can tune the parameter of the dictionary based on the first training is because uh, if I see that uh, there are many duplicates, I can try to tune the number of uh, the size of the dictionary. If I go too high with the number, I start having basically um, 
an atom that is very specific for a, for a signal and try to have too much time, starting having too much computation. So basically, it serves as a no. okay. last question. How do you vectorize the mesh? So the um, the point of the descriptor here uh, is the one that, uh, the point of the descriptor using the dictionary is the one that I use it here. And uh, so um, I can use both a mesh of control of uh, cloud points. It doesn't really matter. I can use the vertex of, uh, of a triangulation. And uh, well, this uh, a grid that uh, created this sector, in, in order to call it, just consider the sector, is placed in uh, each neighborhood of each point. Or uh, a given sector, then uh, and then a scalar value is given to, to the sector, which is equal to the mean uh, value of the curvature of the points that fell in each sector. Okay. By so you have a fixer. What, what I, my point is, um, you have a fixed order. So, so the, the, this uh, representation is not invariant to transformations. So if I do the mesh, then I repeat the mesh, I, 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 I use... That's a, that the, the, the problem that came up here. Uh, yeah. The, the problem that I was talking about here. The the thing is that uh, it's invariant in, in for huge rotation, because for small rotation, if I use a, a sector that is sufficiently small, yeah, okay. it doesn't really change by that much. Okay. Right. Not so small and not... not uh, okay. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, when you intersect uh, the previous method, when you intersect the mesh with the sphere in order to identify the neighborhood of a vertex, I miss the point why it's so crucial to use a sphere. So, the, one of the things you can imagine is that the why use a sphere, why not use, for example, geodesical, uh, geodesical ring. So, um, two reasons. First, uh, um, two things for one reason. The, the first thing to notice is that, again, usually I'm talking about a very small uh, neighborhood. So here there is no real, I mean, there is difference, of course, it's not that different uh, to consider the geodesical or the Euclidean rings. The other is that uh, uh, if I consider the geodesical for, uh, I, I'm adding computational cost to, to this. You know, again, it, it, it's changed the computational cost, but it stays high and I, didn't see a reason to, to do it. I, I tried, but the results didn't change by that much. So for having a slightly more complicated structure to compute the rings, I decided to use the Euclidean one. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.